Hello. <clears throat> Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, and thank you for watching today's in-depth ag forecast brought to you by Nutrient Ag Solutions. Well, last night as I was watching some of the radar imagery, we all noticed something quite interesting if we were paying attention to these storms moving through parts of the plains. And what we were really focused on is right here. Okay, this is the outflow from these storms. And what it ended up forming here was something called an undular bore. That is where the outflow of these storms was kind of pushing up against the very stable layer, the boundary layer that forms in the overnight hours. You can even see, look at all the waves right in here in the flow out of this radar in parts of Nebraska. And it would be neat to see this, but unfortunately it was all happening in the overnight hours and just came out early this morning in this area. Now since then, as I take the radar animation on off to the end here, we've had a lot of scattered convection, scattered storms and rain over parts of the Ohio Valley and the Eastern Corn Belt. That's out ahead of all of this in what we call the warm sector. And then pushing up against this area right here is the current position of our cold front. And behind it, those temperatures have dropped off significantly. There is still some open cell convection uh, in the cold air on the back side of this in the deeper trough, but the main show right now is happening right here. All right. We can take a look at some live lightning data from one of my favorite resources, blitzertongue.org. It's free. You can go check it out. As we just kind of zoom in here and take a really close look at this, you know, some of these lightning strikes here are very frequent along this line that's building to the south through Missouri. So we're going to watch this progress to the east in the overnight. What we've got here is currently a severe thunderstorm watch box in this particular area. But we'll talk about why there's flood watches and warnings here. We'll see the heat in the southern plains, but the cold air that's coming in behind this, well, we've already got these frost and freeze warnings in place here. I'll talk more about temperatures in a few moments. On satellite, you can really see that system curling up, and it is the first of multiple systems we'll be dealing with throughout this week. So the deep convection associated with that frontal boundary here, the open cell convection on the back side of it, that's kind of what you see in this place. This is much cooler air though. And the strong winds uh, still coming through California, still blowing around some smoke in Southern California here. But out ahead of it, you can see all of the, the storms that are in place there still producing a lot of heavy rain. And just to let you know, some of Nicholas is still in this circulation. Crazy to see that. Now, how much of those temperatures change? Take a look. This is the 24-hour temperature change map through about 4 o'clock in the afternoon on Monday. So behind that front, temperatures are anywhere between 20 and 30 degrees colder than they were a day ago. And this is going to usher in the first real blast of almost fall-like weather for parts of the Midwest. But don't get used to it. Uh, you're going to see in a few moments that these temperatures are going to change quite a bit over the next 15 days or so. So coming back to the severe weather threat, uh, this is for the rest of the day today on Monday into tonight. Storm Prediction Center has identified this region for that frontal boundary to continue to pass through. And we can just kind of get an idea on the timing of it by going to our high-res NAM model. So let's go ahead and blow this up, and I'll just show you throughout the day today, the NAM models had a pretty good handle on the timing of these storms. So for example, I'm recording this about 4 o'clock, and here's where we expect them to be by 5 p.m., continuing to build down the line. A lot of scattered storms in this quadrant here as the moisture funnels in. And as we play this forward into the overnight hours, that frontal squalling extends from Wisconsin, almost coming over the Mississippi River here, down into Missouri, and eventually into Oklahoma. All right. Now playing this through the overnight hours, getting out to Tuesday morning, Tuesday mid-morning, and then eventually into Tuesday early afternoon. We see the combination of all the moisture running up into this part of North Carolina over the Tennessee border here, adding a lot of precipitation. And this particular region right in through here is not only getting precipitation from the first front, but watch what curls up behind this as we work our way through Tuesday into Wednesday morning, Wednesday afternoon and evening. You see there's a second low that is pulling through this area, adding a whole lot more rainfall to the Ohio River Valley but behind it, things are really gonna clear out. Now from there, let's go take a look at the surface winds this afternoon, all right? So here's the frontal boundary we just discussed, but there's another one that's way out here over the open Atlantic Ocean. And it's important to be seeing this because right now over the Atlantic, we have higher atmospheric pressure sitting here, and it tends to want to stay there due to these fronts that keep sweeping out of the, well, the east coast of the United States and pushing that subtropical high farther to the east. Now, what's the significance of that? Well, we have Tropical Storm Peter here and Tropical Storm Rose there. So we've been kind of joking around in the meteorological community that we've got Pete Rose out here. Now, just remember, Pete Rose, all-time MLB leader on the hits list. Something to think about. The only person that's still actively playing that's close to him is Albert Pujols. But Pujols would somehow need to hit another thousand 
uh, hits <laughs> to catch up to Pete Rose. So little shout out to Pete Rose there. But anyway, uh, what we're going to talk about here is the fact that because of the position of the subtropical high and these fronts that keep coming through, these cyclones that are developing here, and there's a third one we're going to watch right here, are going to have a very difficult time getting to the United States. Okay, So we see Peter, just barely a, a tropical storm. Rose, just barely a tropical storm. And then 80% chance on this next wave developing. Where are they all going? Peter, Rose, the one that's got an 80% chance of developing. What I'm saying is the timing and the advancement of this last system, the one that's got the 80% chance, and these fronts that come out here over the North Atlantic will be critical to see if it also gets diverted. And if we keep the subtropical high way over here, that's just another indicator that we're gonna push this on around. So we need to then ask ourselves, where are those fronts coming from? And to get that answer, I gotta switch oceans. So now we're gonna come over here to the Pacific, and this is the jet stream level flow. And what I'm watching most carefully is this trough, this trough, and that trough. And the reason why is because as these pieces move, these short waves, and then this longer wave here, as they interact, it is those three features that are eventually gonna drive the pattern, which is gonna be quite wet in the Eastern Corn Belt. Let me show you what I'm talking about. So you see them? One, two, three. Okay, as we play this forward, here we are into Tuesday, getting out into Wednesday morning. Our first trough, there it is, it spins up right here. You saw the tail end of that one coming into the Eastern Corn Belt at the end of my first animation. I'm talking about this one right here, okay? Now from there, watch what's coming through the Canadian Prairie and watch what it does to this trough. Are you ready? As we play this forward, the lead trough is moving north through Michigan and eventually into Ontario, hence the heavy rain we were forecasting in this area. But the open wave on the back side of it is gonna grab this and push it quickly to the north as it pivots down to the south. And that's what we're gonna notice. See how they kind of orbit one another there? But the net effect of all of this is that we reinforce troughing over the east coast Reinforced troughing coming out of Alaska into the Gulf of Alaska, and then broaden a ridge behind it. And that ridge, as the flow comes over and down to the southeast, produces a large area of upper level convergence here, hence the drier weather. And we see that as we go out to next Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, the model is really trying to amplify things. Ridge, 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 and ridge, with broad troughing here and here, in here. And I'm going to come back to that in a few moments, but I wanted to put that kind of in your brain here as we go forward. So what do we have? Well, as we talk about precipitation first, let's get a quick update on the month to date precipitation stats by looking at the ranks by climate district. So take a moment, pause it and have a close look at this because this map is going to change quite a bit here soon, especially in parts of the Carolinas. It's going to change a lot in the Eastern Corn Belt. And as I show you the temperature pattern in a few moments, you're going to see some changes there as well. So let's do a multi-model analysis of the next seven days. We're going to start with the National Weather Service first. This is their total predicted precipitation through the next seven days. So as you notice, coming over here into parts of the Appalachian Mountains and then coming into the Ohio Valley through parts of Ontario and Quebec, there is a region in through here that could be getting anywhere between one to three, maybe four inches of rainfall out of these next few systems. But as soon as that front passes the Western Corn Belt, it's gonna be dry behind it. Okay, so drier in the West. So this is the WPC, this is the European model. Little different projection, but you see a very similar story, right? And this is what we've got from the GFS. About the only difference between the, the ECMWF and the GFS is the GFS is more progressive. It's got this stuff moving to the east a bit faster. But with ridging coming into the West again, it's gonna go over dry after the last weekend's rain. Now from here, why don't we just take a look at the 12Z European model. Rather than doing a multi-model analysis, you saw how similar they are. Let's just stick with one model so we can see it a little bit clearer here. We've already watched through Tuesday, getting into Wednesday, and now let's just pick up where things leave off on Wednesday night. So here is the second low, and it's gonna move straight to the north. And what we do is we watch on forward here. There it is. Here comes that next low behind it, and it's gonna pivot and toss this low to the north, and bring in rain behind it here into Manitoba and parts of uh, you know, Ontario. But the frontal boundary here is still pushing by the time we get to the end of this week through the Northeast. 
All right, where does it all go? Well, that low goes over the Hudson Bay. The other one moves here over uh, parts of you know the Great Lakes, and there could be just a weak frontal boundary that presses through. This is by Saturday morning. But after that, high pressure takes over. Here we are Monday, Tuesday. We might need to be watching where those troughs move through the Great Lakes and into the Northeast for an increased chance at precip. But systems in the Northwest are going to British Columbia. And there's a broad sector of the United States that after this front goes through today, I mean, west of the Mississippi, we're not talking about much, if any, precipitation at all, all the way out to the end of this animation. So uh, that's it on precip. It will be windy, though. These were the winds forecast for today in the central plains. And then what you're going to notice is by the time we get into tomorrow morning, uh, then to, th uh, through Wednesday, we're going to see some strong winds wrap up. There it is around that first low moving to the north here. And we continue to bring in behind that second low coming in late this week, stronger winds into the northern plains as well. Look at that. That's Friday afternoon. Very strong synoptic scale winds here. We also continue to see throughout the entirety of this week, stronger winds offshore in California as well. So what I'm showing you this for is just to let you know, with this changing pattern, expect some windy days to be coming through here. Now, what about once we get out to day 10? Now, this is interesting. This is September 30th. The pattern is doing something a bit like this. Okay, there is a ridge here a ridge here and a ridge here. In fact, there's broad ridging over this entire area and broader troughing here. Now, let me get those drawings off there. There's our troughs and there's our ridges. And the concern is, is this pattern blocked up in any sort of way? Do these ridges prevent the progression of this pattern? So going into the first week of October, we do get a sense that it is not open and moving as much as we'd like. We did take that trough, though, and move it into the Pacific Northwest. But generally speaking, with ridging being replaced in this area, ridging replacing what was in this area, look at what it does to the precipitation pattern. It's overall drier in this region. We tend to push those troughs into the Northwest, and this is a change from the previous runs where we've now increased rainfall in the Northwest. But overall, after, like I said, from day four through day 15, this is going to be an area that is going to favor drier conditions rather than wetter. And you saw that there weren't any tropical systems we were concerned about hitting out of the Gulf Coast or hitting the East Coast in the next several uh, days as well, getting into the beginning of October. So what I think this means is very favorable conditions in the Midwest for harvest after we dry out from what's going to be hitting the Eastern Corn Belt through the Southeast that will eventually pull into the Northeast as well. From there, let's talk about temperatures. This is the month-to-date temperature map. So it kind of just gives you an idea on the ranks of our 129 years worth of data, set, uh, data here uh, in the data set. Now, where we've already had frost this year, I kind of zoomed in on the Pacific Northwest because this is kind of where we've had the cooler weather, weather so far. Now, the map shows you the number of hours since the beginning of September that have been spent below freezing, but you don't have to worry about the colors. Just look for where there is shading. That would tell us where we've already had a frost so far this year, according to the RTMA data set. Now, as you know, there's some colder air behind that front, and we're certainly watching this area for some of those colder temperatures. But let's get an idea on what they're going to look like by first looking at our max temperatures. So we see that from today on Monday into Tuesday, that colder air follows the front, and now we've got these highs in the 60s and 70s in the midsection of the country. Moving forward into Wednesday, that cold front continues to press forward, and a place like Indianapolis may have a difficult time getting out of the low 60s on Wednesday. The overnight lows, though, stay in the 40s in this area. But look at the rebound once again in the temperatures here in the northern plains. This is what happens when the pattern stays as active as it is. There's Thursday's highs getting into Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, where the ridge now really begins to rebuild in the west. Now, using the National Blended Model Forecast, what I'd like to show you here is we're going to be looking here hour by hour through the next three days as to where we expect those overnight lows to possibly get into the 40s or maybe in the 30s. So you're looking for these colors right in through here. And you can see how cold that air is on the backside and the sub-freezing temperatures in the mountains. But notice we don't see major frost event behind this particular front. Where do we possibly get concerned about it? Well, I'm going to take you out here to, let's go out, uh, there's Wednesday morning. We're looking pretty chilly behind this line right here on Wednesday morning. 
And then as I go out to Thursday, we might be looking at a frost event right in through here up in this part of Ontario with temperatures coming back into the upper 30s in parts of the Great Lakes states. Again, this is all behind that second low that moves through there. But looking out there exclusively at day 5 through 10, well, the trough is here, the ridge there, the downstream trough, and then it immediately turns back up. You saw that. So we're going to favor cooler than normal temperatures day 5 through 10 with temperatures here in the west going anywhere between 5 and 15 degrees above average. And that lasts. This is all the way out there day 10 through 15. You can now see how the pattern opens that broader ridge here as the trough exits the east coast. So we're going on a bit of a whiplash pattern here with temperatures into the, you know, the beginning of October. Now, speaking of October, uh, one of the reasons why I record these so late in the day on Monday is I wait on the new European weekly forecast. And that's what you've got here. It comes out on Monday afternoon and again on Thursday afternoon. The models are attempting to keep the pattern that's in place and kick it down the road. They've been doing this now for a while. So you notice, remember I just showed you week two was drier in through here with anything in the tropics staying out offshore. And we were trying to bring in better moisture into the west with the troughs that we're digging in there you can almost see that same pattern carried through the month of October. Now, if it verifies, this would be outstanding for harvest weather here uh, in, the, uh, you know, in the central United States and in the east. And we'd love to see some early moisture return to northern California, Oregon, and Washington, uh, especially after last weekend's precipitation underperformed in this particular area. The temperature pattern, again, the models are just hanging on to persistence. And I'm going to show it to you, but I'm going to remind you that even though the models are forecasting a warm October, it's October. We will expect to see frequent frontal passages that drop the temperatures off and swing up and down and up and down. I mean, how do you get a flat line? Draw, you know, Take the average of a line that's got a lot of waves in it. And that's what we're doing here. We're going to be seeing the average be slightly warmer than normal, but the overall progress of the temperatures is going to be highly volatile. Last thing I just want to finish up with is another update on La Nina. I've looked at every major teleconnection. I've looked at the MJO. We've been looking at momentum. Of course, we're talking about all the different oscillations that deal with our jet stream pattern. But in general, the, the construction or deconstruction of each of those together doesn't give you any more information than the trough ridge pattern I showed you. So what's the only other thing? It's these ocean temperatures. We've seen them continue to cool in this area on stronger trade winds. And like I reported last week, the Southern Oscillation Index is still climbing. It's now up here close to 10. You know you want to be above a value of 7 to be considered a base state of La Nina. And just as a reminder of where we're going forward, notice that the correlation to precipitation in October-November, well, these warmer colors represent a correlation with drier conditions and the bluer colors with wetter. So it appears that wetter in parts of the west, in the Pacific Northwest, is favored, drier in the central and southern plains, and also in the southeast, if La Nina is the dominant pattern. And that's what I keep watching for you, all right? I'll report back to you again uh, on Thursday as we see the latest updates. Appreciate your attention. We'll talk to you then. Thank you.